Hello and welcome to today's mini masterclass with me, James Roy. I'm the producer at Westwards, and today I'm talking to Kirsty Eager, young adult writer from the northern beaches of Sydney, who has uh, four titles to her name, well-regarded titles, Raw Blue, Night Beach, Saltwater Vampires, and Summer Skin. And today, uh, well, we've had a, a bit of a chat already, Kirsty, about a whole bunch of stuff, but today we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to be talking about screenwriting from your own work. Uh, how are you today? Are you well? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you for having me. That's okay. Are you um, safe and locked down and all those things? I'm just trying to take it day by day. And we're just, I guess, um, in our family, normally my husband's a football coach, so he's not normally home in the afternoons and evenings and weekends. So we're just thinking the benefit of this is that we have him around a bit more than normal. So that's been the good mm. thing. Yeah. He doesn't coach Manly, does he? No. He's, oh, that's um, good. He's actually, no, he's actually, he's a Penrith boy originally and oh. he coaches, he's, when I say football, I mean soccer. So oh. I have to say football because if you yeah. are a soccer person and you don't, and you say soccer rather than football, people think you're not a football person. No. Um, yeah, he, he's the um, technical director at Northern Tigers. He oh. coaches their women's team at the moment and oversees all the other coaches. So we're very proud of him. Yeah. I, I thought about talking to you about this a little while ago when we were out at a, uh, a school festival day out at, where were we? Cherry Brook Technical High, I think it was. Yeah, Technology High. And you mentioned that you were in the process of adapting your first novel, Raw Blue, into a screenplay. And I thought that would be an interesting thing to talk about because in this current day and age, the uh, we're in a bit of a golden age of television, aren't we, and, and movies where we're all staying at home and watching streamed services and so forth. Was that part of the reason that made part of the reason that you went in this direction or was it something different? Um, short answer, no, it had been a long held dream and I'd had, so Raw Blue was published in 2009. So it's been out there for quite a while. It, when it sort of came out, I had a couple of different groups approach me about um, getting the rights to option it to do a film and in the end I turned them down and I thought any other book yeah go ahead that one no it's a pretty personal story so uh it, it just didn't feel right and I I had a very quiet little dream that I wouldn't have told anyone and that was that I really wanted to be involved a lot more with bringing it to a feature film so luckily I'd been approached by someone um, a few years ago and then Oddly, I just started writing the script thinking, look, if I don't do this now, I never will. It seemed very intimidating to me, but I thought, look, I've got to sort of back it. Um, I keep boring people with this dream of mine. Uh, and I sort of started circling how to go about writing a script. And then um, the guy who'd approached me a couple of years ago came back and uh, we had a few chats. And what was really key from that meeting for me was that it was going to be a collaboration and since then, it has been an absolute joy working with him. We, um, It's been really good for me. Do you think everyone has a price? If they'd come to you and said, we want to take over Raw Blue completely, do you think there would have been a dollar point where you would have gone, oh, yeah, all right? Not willingly. I Not think willingly. Yeah. <laughs> just in terms of, well, you know what, it's right. You, you've got a family and um, you definitely have financial responsibility. So I'm sure if they'd come back with some amazing amount, I would have had to hand it over. But uh, that particular story, it, I would have found that very hard. Do you think it's a little bit like being a, a picture book illustrator where you, or a picture book writer where you, um, you kind of have to let go of a little bit of your own personal input though once you start collaborating with someone? Uh, yeah, I, I I guess you do. Like it wouldn't bother. That's the thing. It doesn't necessarily bother me, the collaboration. I like the fact that other people have views. But I think what's really interesting actually in terms of stories at the moment, uh, in screen and so on screen, sorry, and in publishing, I think there's a bit more respect for the, I guess, the the ownership of the story. Or not ownership of story, but just the authenticity of story so I, I feel like that probably works in yeah in connection with it a bit it's hard so I'm not being very articulate but I guess the thing is there's something like raw blue there's a couple of different strands to that story that I think really need to be done well and 
uh, unless someone could convince me otherwise, well, then I would think, yeah, I definitely should have input. It's important. So, yeah. So let's go back to the uh, the writing of the original book, which was, that was quite a while ago, wasn't it, um, yeah. Rob? What are we talking, 10, maybe 15? How, long, how many years ago is it? Uh, I wrote it in 2006. Right. And I remember that very clearly because I wrote it, the first draft, I mean, this never happens to me. I'm such a slow writer. But in this case, once again, it was this thing I really, really wanted to write. I had no... Um, I had another, I had actually sold to Order of Vampires. I'd done a draft of that at the same time. I knew that it commercially was probably a, a better bet, but Raw Blue was the book I wrote thinking no one would ever want to publish it. It was just the thing I really was, I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but I really was dying to write that story. I, it was burning in me. So I wrote it in two months and, um, yeah, and then I spent probably another couple of years just circling it, I think, just getting feedback and, it, it was the first thing I wrote where, because I hadn't been published yet, and it was the first thing I wrote where I, rather than rushing and thinking, right, if I get this done, if I redraft, if I whatever, I can, I might actually make it. It was the first thing I wrote where I thought, I don't care about getting published. I want to just do this story justice. And that was a real, that was great for me, I think, as a writer, because it made me realise that um, someone else said this, I can't remember who it is but off the top of my head, but Someone was, oh, I know, it was Seth Godin, the marketing guru guy, and he mm. was talking, I don't know if you've, you, he's just put out a, book, a book about um, creative work and he was saying you should really, you know, people say, well, what would you do if you knew you can't fail? He says the question should be what would you do if you knew you could fail and you just do it anyway? And that's that really resonated for me because I think it's that work that you can't even explain why you want to do it necessarily in terms of a commercial outcome or a, you know, a pathway to publication. It's just the thing you really, really are dying to write. And I think there needs to be a justification for writing in that sense because the thing is too, when you write something, you learn so much. It's not it's not like you're just on your soapbox. It's actually at its best. I think it's a really humble process. And, you you know, for me, I've always been working and doing other things at the same time. So, you know. So the person you're collaborating with, they obviously got, obviously got a background in film already. Yeah, yeah, Nick has, yeah. So he comes from DP, a director of photography background. And, um, yeah, he's great in terms of story. He's good for bouncing the script off. We've got it to a point where uh, we were lucky enough last year to get some Screen New South Wales funding for development. So that meant I could go away and write the first draft and also we could get a script editor on board to give us some feedback on that first draft. Uh, so I've now I'm now in the process of finishing the second draft based on that feedback. So yeah, and Nick's like me in that we both want uh, we're looking for a project to do together. Um, we work well together, and also we want to bring the story to fruition ourselves. So we're looking to co-direct as well. So a lot of people when they write in you know, novelists, if you like, um, write in a very filmic way. I think I'm probably one of those who often works that way where. I mean, I use a word processor called Scrivener that allows you to work in a scene-by-scene scene way, and that's how I construct my work. Is that how you work generally as well? Do you do you write in a fairly filmic way? And if so, do you think that helped in the transition or did that actually make it more difficult to adapt a screenplay? Oh, that's such a good point. Uh, I think that I really love the scene-based approach now. When I wrote Raw Blue, um, it it certainly didn't come out that way, although I can look back now and think, oh, yeah, there's definite scenes and setup going on here. But now for me it tends to be a lot more scene-based and I think that's been helpful, um, but it, it hasn't always necessarily translated neatly because I think the thing is when you come from a novel background, you're used to having an abundance of scenes, whereas um, <laughs> the problem with like a feature film particularly is there's just a limit to the scenes so you really uh I do try to do I'm sure you're the same look in my writing if I write a scene I'm trying to have a couple of things accomplished within that scene so not like you know it's not just one tick per scene in terms of mm. story progression I'm really trying to make a couple of things happen at once so the reader really has to work um mm. in a good way they're very engaged but even that yeah I think that's been the the telling thing for me is that yeah, they're de they're, it's definitely a different type of storytelling. It's, it's yeah, there's definite differences there. Well, it's different on the way it 
different in the way it appears to the view to the viewer or the audience, but it's also, I think, different to the way you describe what happens on the page. I mean, I, I think that having done a little bit of screenwriting myself at, at a uni level, um, I found that scenes could be condensed down a lot more in the screenplay than they can than they need to be in a book. You know, oftentimes you'll have a whole scene in a, if you're watching your favourite show. There might be a scene where there might be one line of dialogue or none at all and really you're handing over to the the actor and the director to make that scene work for you is that a difficult thing in your mind not not that it's been made yet but is it difficult in your mind to go i'm going to have to have some reliance on the people who are putting this into the world that they're going to see the the vision the way that i do yeah it, oh definitely i think that's what's really funny about um screenwriting is that exactly what you're saying it's that thing of like all the time with me especially it's like when i say drafts obviously with any any draft there's a number of rewrites so with me writing that first draft and the millions of rewrites i did the big issue was um the amount of direction i guess i had on the page all the time in terms of what for me would be a scene set up so there would be you know i'd want these specific things there i'd want the actor doing this and whatever and you can't do that like you're not allowed to do that so that all got pulled out again and you really do have to have faith that and i think that's the beauty of collaboration is that for me now i'm excited thinking wow when we cast this it will be incredible to see what an actor will do with that character and how they will bring them to life and it may not be the way that i see the character but that's fine as long as that character has a sort of truth you know that's working so yeah it's funny when we talk about scenes in a prose sense it you really are um painting the picture for your viewer but uh, but on you know script in script writing no absolutely not you're pulling it all out you, you're doing bare bones so if you pick a detail it's got to do quite a lot of talking you know it can't, so I guess what we can't do about, lots of detail yeah I guess what we're talking about then is you know in a novel you might write about him slapping his hands on the table rolling his eyes and stomping off but in the screenplay you might he might say something like um you know oh god not this not this nonsense again and he leaves yes. and then mm. that gives the the is that the kind of thing you're talking about giving the actor something to work with rather than just giving them direction yes and then the horrible thing is they want like it has to be even harder <laughs> and then you're trying to do things via subtext so you've got you know two characters discussing something which isn't the real issue but the audience has to somehow know that what the real issue is what the real conflict is underneath that discussion and yeah, I find that very, it's really tricky, you know. And if anything, I think the the tendency is to um, spell it out and you really can't be that linear. You just have to let it rest and know that it's almost like the space does all the work, the space in between the words. And it's, yeah, it's very sparse. I can imagine so, that if you had a really top drawer actor looking at your your screenplay, if, if they felt it was being too directed and too, they probably wouldn't take the project on, would they? Because it's kind of stifling their own, what they love to do and what they're good at doing. Yeah, there has to be space for, for other people to come in. And that I think that's a beautiful thing. Like that's the really, well, and I like, you know, I'm still in the early stages of the process. If we think I'm still at the script stage, so this is in development. But uh, to me, that's just the exciting part, like getting other people in and their vision and their energy and all of that goes into it. So it's, yeah, I think it's a really interesting art form in that sense. Yeah, I think it's for myself. I think it's something that I'm. <laughs> I need to really work on. I, I for my uni, I did a, a screen adaptation of my book Captain Mac, which is only twenty twenty. Was it thirty two thousand words? It's a very small book. It ended up being a mini series of two feature length pieces, and, wow. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. which obviously isn't isn't going to fly. It needs to be really condensed. But I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. How do you know where to begin trimming things down? How do you how do you know, you know, in, in a novel you might be going, we need to repeat this particular little trope a couple of times to develop a little bit of a trajectory here. Um, how do you condense that down in a film setting? It's, uh, I'm sure you would know how to, James. I'm sure, like, you're such a good writer, you'd be able to do it. Um, I think for me the way it's worked is it's given me a new appreciation for knowing what the story is like what's at the heart of the story 
And once you understand that, and it's been really interesting between drafts as well. First draft, I feel like I, I didn't go away from the story, but I really cut, changed, pulled back. Uh, and oddly, second draft, I feel like I'm going back to something that's a, a lot closer to the book, but I seem to have pruned out all the unnecessary stuff that isn't story. So I think it's you start by just knowing, just really being acquainted with the story. So what is it? And when I say that, I mean really thinking about what your character wants on a surface level and then what your character needs underneath that and then uh, what their interactions with people are like on that basis and those secondary characters just thinking about what they want as well and how it all comes together. So you've always got sort of a sense of conflict, not in the most literal way, but, you know, every scene's informed by people wanting slightly different things. So, yeah, it's, I don't know if that's answered your question. I hope so. <laughs> but, yeah, for me it's really, really you need to know your story. And I think probably for anyone who wants to be a storyteller, be it, by writing books or writing scripts I don't think it's a I think it's a really good way to approach whatever it is you're about to do anyway because I I can't see why more writers aren't doing you know aren't doing this you know to just make sense to me I think um writers have a really good understanding of story and that's why the film world is constantly looking to adapt our work because the story I wonder if the story is deep yeah, I wonder if the reason is what we've touched on, though, is that people are just a bit precious about turning over their story to another, you know, because when you're a writer, you, especially when you're a new writer, you're very much, in many cases, people are going, um, you know, don't change a word, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. And then mm. you get to the editorial stage and suddenly you've got someone who's been in the game for 25 years going, actually, there's a lot of work to be done here and here's how. And that becomes a question then of your own humility and whether you're prepared to actually be that writer who takes on advice. If you've been through all that process as a writer, then to have to turn around and do it all again at, with your story as a screenplay, is that is that a challenging thing to do? Or do you, did, it sounds to me like you embraced that and just enjoyed that process of wallowing around in your story and getting to tell it again in a different way. Yeah, I really do. And actually, uh, to answer the first part of your question, I do actually enjoy, so, you know, when you hand your novel in, I do really like working with an editor. I love that part because I feel, if anything, most of their suggestions are to help you really hone in on the story and clarify your story. So I don't, that I don't, I'm never sort of a writer who objects to that. I really like that because to me too, they might, they might, I think, too, it depends on the type of feedback you're getting. So if you're getting feedback where they're throwing up what were problems for them without trying to find solutions, to me that's good feedback because they're backing you as a, you know, creative person to come up with a solution and it, it's respectful and why not? So to me often if I get feedback, even if I don't necessarily agree with it, uh, it's enough that it's a problem for someone and I think, okay, well, it's my job now to try and come up with some sort of solution which fits both of us if it has to. Honestly, most of the time I think any editor that's worked with me would say it's very rare for me to have a problem with that, to not to not work with the suggestion, really rare. And usually it would be only on something, some minute detail that for me seems important but, you know, they don't care less either way. Well, that's a, that's um, a good reputation to have because there's lots of other writers who have quite the opposite reputation. So that that's a good one. Oh, really? One to have. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that actually. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I, I, I've never heard any of those stories. A lot of the so. grown-up writers, and I say this is a YA, <laughs> a lot of the grown-up writers are very precious. Anyway. Okay. And, yeah, and no, a few I, of the YA ones. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, well, really, for me, it's that's never been an issue. Um, and I think maybe too, maybe that's too, just having the sense of your story. So unless it's not really fundamentally changing the core of what your story is most of the time, I don't think. This story particularly, once again, it's not, um, I guess the thing is my wanting involvement was because of the nature of the story. It's personal. So that that had to be there. And the other weird thing is because it's got surfing in it as well, I thought I just cannot hand this over to someone and they make some, you know, cowabunga, gnarly dude, stupid surf film. I can't. Like, I just can't. I just want to write. So for us that's really important too. It's like representing surfing as we know it. So not, you know, competitive, not whatever. The rhythms of a beach day-to-day is it's a very different thing. And that's coming at it, you know, you've got to remember too, I grew up in central Queensland, so I'm not from the northern beaches. I'm an outsider, but I have been allowed in. So I, it, it's a really odd 
place to be, I think, in some What's ways. What's your favourite central Queensland break? <laughs> oh, um, Bangalee, which is north of Yapoon, and oh. the other one I love is Five Rocks. And they, they, the surf there is, well, not, sorry, it's not terrible. It's just um, very limited, mm. yeah. <laughs> but we used to surf because my parents were divorced, so I lived with mum. And um, so we'd get to the beach just with dad on holidays. So, you know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't lucky, not, not lucky, but I'm someone who's loved it so much that eventually that's how I decided to set my life up, somehow work or make it all work that I could surf. But, yeah, I'm, it's yeah it's a funny thing like for me it's that's what this story is about too it's just people who love it that much you know and I'm surrounded by them like most of my friends are tradies and they're tradies so they can surf you know it's just what they do so anyway it's yeah. totes gnarly bra is that the <laughs> yeah yeah there's a oh there's a show <laughs> yeah I won't even go there there's a yeah. show coming soon called ultimate surfer and it just looks so funny it's like every cliche you could yeah, possibly yeah. imagine and that's the other thing I don't want to take it too seriously because I just think I'm sick of deep and meaningful epic surf stories where, you know, it's all about men being men and dominating. And I think, yeah, that's so far removed from my experience. So, yeah, whatever. Yeah, if you're a girl surfer, you've got to lose an arm before anyone wants to make a movie about you, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, what a blue crush. I don't know. It's funny. I think actually weirdly, um, I don't know, have you seen Girls Can't Surf, the documentary? I can't say that I have. Oh, well, I highly recommend it. And okay. it's Australian and it's mm-hmm. about... Um, women who were competitive surfers in the 80s and yeah it's really funny and really good and and just like how uneven those two playing fields were and but just the humor in it was fantastic so I thought actually oddly and they make the point I think with surfing what's odd is that a lot of the the for those big surf brands it was the women's side of the business that was making heaps of money for them but they spent all of the sponsorship dollars on the men so anyway that's a whole other that's not my expertise at all so um i feel like we're i feel like i've gone a long way away from whatever you asked well, me so. yeah, no, it's okay. so, so, me. <laughs> finally um obviously once you've got a bit of a handle on how screenwriting works you can you can see that there's a massive market for someone who can write for screen and, and more importantly someone who can pitch to the people who decide what to make um, i have have been told by people who know that all of these big um, streaming services like Amazon and Hulu and Netflix and all the rest of it uh, have so much money to spend on on stories, and there is a bit of a bit of a a thirst, a real thirst or a hunger for uh, for more for more okay. content. Do you think at some point you'll go? Okay, so I've got Raw Blue made that whether or not that quite works, but you know you'll do your best to make that the the movie you want it to be. Will you then become a gun for hire and just start writing screenplays that just earn development money and maybe never get made? Do you see, can you see yourself being a, a mercenary kind of screenwriter, or do you really want to bring that personal passion to everything you write? No, I yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so I'm going to unpack it in two parts, if that's okay. I don't cool. know how we're going for time. So no, you're not. okay. So the first part of your question, I think, is a really interesting thing for any Australian um, creative. Uh, working in stories and that is that at the moment we do have Netflix and Stan and all those guys with lots of money however there is absolutely no um, law yet in terms of what percentage of their content needs to be domestic so this is something that I really hope we do eventually bring into play because um, there's no obligation on them to have to make Australian content. They mm. might. I'm sure I'm sure there's opportunities there, but it would be nice if they actually had to give back a little in terms of the local industry. And our stories, I'd like to see our stories. I mean, we're all watching Netflix, so I'd really like to see a lot of Australian stories on Netflix as well just because it's that's another place where our stories are heard. Um, so that's, that's probably the first point. So, yeah, I definitely think there's lots of opportunity. For me personally, yeah, this is the this is the project that is a heart project, but I am certainly a very pragmatic person, and in terms of stories, definitely. Um, so after this project, yeah, I would definitely like to have some working opportunities, and I will be as <laughs> pragmatic about that as it takes. That said, and I think this is the I guess the share for other people who might be interested in this. I strongly believe you've got to be a bit do it yourself. 
on everything. And my view is too, if um, if you're not getting the opportunity or chance, I think you push forward as hard as you can on your own terms. And, you know, maybe it means we also turn into guerrilla filmmakers a little bit. And there's people, someone that I think is a huge inspiration for me in that regard is a director called Sean Baker. And he's probably most well-known for a film called The Florida Project. Uh, it's probably a bit old for a teen audience, but it's on ABC iView. And I love the fact he did have um, some producers behind him, but he's been given a lot of rope to do his own thing. But before that, he used to just, he, he, he kept making his own films on his own terms. So I think, you know, for me, definitely, I'd like to work with um, bigger established uh, infrastructure and people and production companies with ideas that are designed to try and find a market. And if not, then... Yeah, I think the the answer might be just to keep pushing forward either way. So. I mean, I, I think for me that what looks like the perfect the perfect scenario here is something like Shit's Creek, where um, you know <laughs> I've, I'm I'm kind of fascinated with that show because it's it's incredibly clever and it's really warm and it's you know it's non judgmental in all sorts of ways, but it's it's also very funny. It's got a couple of my favourite actors in it, uh, but the the great thing about it is when you look at the way it's been made and you you see the behind the scenes and you that you see the interviews with Daniel Levy and um it's the collaboration not just of the writers but the the actors and the directors and it becomes a real community I think that probably feels to me like the the ultimate dream of a screenwriter is to be involved in a big writing room where everybody has opinions that are warmly shared and then they all get together to make the damn thing and feel really proud of the product I mean I'm probably probably making it a lot rosier than it is in reality, but that's certainly the image they give. I I think that's achievable too. I hope that is because if you, like you find this from um, having worked in publishing, like you know when you find someone who does the work, so meaning someone who's a really good editor or, um, you know, book designer or a great publisher, like you sort of know it's a real pleasure to work with them. So maybe it's as simple as finding other people that you can do the work with and, and hopefully sticking with them. And there's a lot of Levy's in the product in the um, credits for that show. I think it's very much a family <laughs> yeah. affair. I, I didn't realise that Twilight, do you watch it? Do you watch Shit's Creek? No, I don't. I'm sorry. No, for no, anyone no. who's listening, it might surprise you to hear that Twyla, who works at the cafe, is actually Daniel Levy's sister and um, oh, wow. his daughter. Yeah. So. But then there's Sarah Levy's involved, who's, uh, I'm not sure if she's a sister, and there's a couple of Levy's in the production. So as a whole, it's a bit of a family affair, but it's it's beautifully warm. Uh I will watch it now, James. Yeah. You you have to, and and a lot of people watch the first couple of episodes and go, oh, it's a bit contrived. But you've got to stay with it because it it really is incredibly, it's incredibly. I guess warm is the best best word I can come up. We, with. We use that actually, warm and not mean, and I really like that. That's that's something. Yeah, that that's really interested me that you said that. So yeah. yeah. Mm. So before we finish, uh, very last question for you. What what do you think you've taken from this process that has made you a, a, a better writer across the board you know has it, has it been a process that has deepened your understanding of how story works and how how you operate as a writer yeah it definitely has deepened my respect for storytelling as a skill generally not just you know with application to me and it's given me a new appreciation for how hard it is and I don't mean hard in a way that's meant to put people off I want people to see that telling stories is a real opportunity and not everyone, I think people can do it, but not everyone's going to do it because it involves a lot of uncertainty and just turning up every day and doing the work and hoping it all works out. And I guess I've forgotten who coined this term, but there's a phrase going around called deep work and by that what I mean is work that is without distraction and where you're relying on your brain to come up with answers over time, layer by layer. And I think it's one of those skills and I really think um, it's made me quite hopeful actually in terms of more than ever I think the world needs stories and there's definitely going to be opportunity out there and I would encourage anyone who enjoys doing it to keep persevering and try it in different forms because you always sort of learn from the process. That's terrific. Well, we all look forward to seeing raw blue on our screens, either on the big screen, if we ever get back to looking at big screens again. I don't know, maybe the cinema industry is going to be dead and buried after this uh, current 
crisis. Who knows? But uh, we certainly look forward to seeing raw blue on our screens uh, in the future. And thank you so much for talking to us today. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much, James, and thanks for listening, everyone.